At Emanuel AME Church in Charleston tonight, the wake for Reverend and State Senator Clementa Pickney is still ongoing. This is a live picture. Pickney was one of the nine people murdered in the church by a white supremacist just over a week ago. Earlier today, the first funeral held for the two of those victims. Ethel Lance, age 70, who worked for 30 years as a custodian at Emanuel AME, and Sharonda Coleman Singleton, 45, a high school speech therapist and track and field coach. Tomorrow, President Obama will deliver the eulogy at Reverend Pickney's funeral, which will be open to the public at the College of Charleston. But even as the community mourns the victims of last week's massacre, the flag embraced by their confessed killer still flies above the grounds of the South Carolina State House, where a horse-drawn carriage bearing Reverend Pickney's casket passed right in front of it yesterday, taking his body to lie in state at the Capitol. Elsewhere in the country, however, the movement to banish the battle flag from public life continues to advance. The National Park Service announced today it's pulling all Confederate flag merchandise from bookstores and gift shops nationwide. Well, Apple is now banning all games and apps featuring the flag from the iTunes App Store, though it's now restoring the ones that use it for historical or educational purposes. And over the last week, as the politics around the battle flag have shifted with lightning speed, the country finally seems to be having a debate 150 years overdue, to be plain about it about the painful, contentious legacy of the Confederacy. On one side of it, you've got the arguments made by South Carolina's Jeff O'Kane to NBC News correspondent Ron Allen. A quarter of the men in South Carolina died to protect this state and its families. That's what it's about. That flag is because the North invaded the South to say, no, 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 you're not going nowhere. That flag never had anything to do about slavery. On the other side, you've got Georgetown law professor Paul Butler, who had this response to a caller in NPR who descended from Confederate veterans. I think we need to focus on gun control and not be sidetracked by this. But I'm not somebody who thinks the battle flag should stay there, but I certainly honor my ancestors. I have no respect for your ancestors. Uh, as far as your ancestors are concerned, I, I shouldn't be a law professor at Georgetown. I should be a slave. Uh, that's why they fought that war. Uh, I don't understand what it means to be proud of a legacy of, of, of terrorism and violence. Uh, last week at this time, I was in Israel. The idea that... Uh, uh, a, a German would say, um, you know, that thing we did called the Holocaust, that was wrong, but I respect the courage of my Nazi ancestors. That wouldn't happen. The reason people can say what you said in the United States is, is because, again, black life just doesn't matter to a lot of people. Joining me now is Paul Butler, Georgetown professor of law at Georgetown University. And Paul, I was really uh, struck by the kind of frank honesty of that response, but it, but it gets to the heart of the matter. Do you think we are now having the conversation we should be, or, or is the sort of move against the flag happening with such rapidity that it's actually papering over the actual substance of the issue? It's a necessary conversation, Chris, but it's kind of surreal that it's necessary. I really was expected to provide a list of reasons about why I don't respect people who thought my ancestors were property. That's bizarre, just like it's bizarre that there has to be a special convening of the legislature in South Carolina to debate whether to take down a, a racist uh, flag. The fact that we have to have that debate, again, is evidence that, that black lives just don't matter that much. You know, some people agree with me on the merits, but they said it was rude uh, to say that I don't respect that a woman's ancestor. So let me get this right. Uh, a white person says to a black person, I, I honor the people who wanted your ancestors to be slaves. That's fine. Uh, a black person says, I don't honor those people. That's rude. Again, that's white privilege all over again. And, and it goes to a larger issue that when black people talk to white people about white supremacy, we're supposed to be loving and forgiving. Hmm. The problem is love and forgiveness are not productive in American politics. That's not how social change is achieved. You know, you could do it through organizing, you could do it through electoral politics, you could take it to the streets, but being nice in the face of white supremacy does not advance racial justice. Are, it sounds like, have you been getting a lot of blowback from this particular moment? Because I saw uh, it, it really did bl blow up, but I think because of the sort of frank honesty of it, have you been, have you been uh, targeted for it? 
a, a tremendous amount of support, and again, a, a lot of people who thought that I wasn't respectful enough to this white woman who really was an ally. She gets it, and a part you didn't play, she said that she thought that the flag should come down. And, and Chris, that made me think of all these people who are doing the right thing, well-intentioned white folks in Charleston who are marching with the protesters to, to take down the flag. But get this, the terrorists chose Charleston because it used to be the center of African-American life in South Carolina. In 1980, the city was 50 percent black. Today, it's two-thirds white. Black people got pushed out of the city. They got pushed out of opportunity. So I think a lot of the good white people who think that the flag should come down don't understand their relationship mm. with white supremacy. They don't get how they benefit from gentrification, from denying opportunities to black people. There are so many taboos and niceties around all of this, um, and it has struck me the emphasis on civility. I think there's, there's some real value in, in maybe uh, being less concerned about civility. And Chris, where I really learned that was in Israel, because we all know they've got lots of problems. Uh, I went to dinner with a Palestinian law professor and, and an Orthodox Jewish law professor, mm. And they went at it. You know, <laughs> their discord was out in the open. They didn't try to, yeah, they didn't try to make nice like we do in the United States. And, and again, I think in order to have that conversation, it's going to be raw. Feelings are going to get hurt. But look, African Americans, more than our feelings, have been getting hurt for 400 years. So this is the time. All right, Paul Bleckler, thank you. It's always great to have you on. Great to be here.